Hello and welcome to the In The Money Players Podcast. This is our show for Monday, March 27th. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital. I was going to try to fake it that I was feeling all better, but as you can hear from my voice, I'm still dealing with a little larynx stuff. Hopefully it won't be too unpleasant for the viewers and listeners. We soldiered through a uh, five plus hour Sky Sports shift yesterday with it. And, and I've noticed that when you give out winners, people don't really complain about the voice. So that was, that was good um, as far as yesterday went. Today, we're not giving out winners. We're looking back at what we saw this weekend and what we might learn from it. And we had three-year-old prep racing everywhere in the world, more or less, across Saturday and Sunday to talk about it all with us. The man who joins us here from uh, Sam Houston from InTheMoneyPodcast.com. He's Nick Tamaro. Nick, how are things? Going great, Pete. Another fun weekend in the books. And now we're getting to the real meat of it in early April. This is a lot of fun these next couple of weeks. And so I'm looking forward to seeing how everything plays out. Let's start off looking at the Louisiana Derby, a race that was won by a horse that, you know, you've been talking about on these airwaves ever since uh, the maiden run in Kings Barnes. Um, undeniably, this was not uh, what you would call a difficult trip. And the number didn't come back incredibly fast. It came back just at a 95. My first thought was, I can't wait to bet against this horse when he next appears. And then I, I had one of those like, little mental flashbacks to a to a few years ago and uh always dreaming's race in the florida derby but and i should have looked this up beforehand i think always dreaming with his soft trip in there ended up with a better final time figure and and therefore a better late pace figure that maybe stamped him as more of a genuine contender anyway at this point king's barnes horse i know you've liked for a long time where do you stand with him uh as he stands on the the precipice of going to the kentucky derby as one of the top five choices um, I mean, I would be happy to bet against him as one of the top five choices, no doubt about it. Um, you know, I kind of alluded to that on Saturday evening saying, you know, good, good things about the race that he ran or um, that we were now going to be able to at least pencil in a little bit more speed on the, in the race itself. And on top of it, we're going to get a, you know, we're going to be dealing with a horse that's going to be a relatively short price that really, you know, to me doesn't have much of a chance at all. And, and, and I don't mean to sound flippant with all of it, but I mean, I just, I can't harp on it enough that this was about as easy a trip as you're going to get, right? I mean, on the front end, just about isolated, a 49 and three half mile where the first near quarter went in a straightaway. I mean, that is dawdling. I don't know. I meant to check and see if, uh, if Craig had pace figures in yet, but I mean, they have to be extremely slow, um, about as slow as you can get for you know, for that level. So I had a couple of people answer me, you know, well, what about his ability to rate because he switched off like that? That's just a money losing approach, right? When you take that approach, you just end up losing money betting that way because you will, you will assume things that you think could happen based on something that happened that was really entirely different. So uh, we don't have pace figures in there yet. I did just check. Um, but you know, that being said, he's a good horse with some upside. I won't blame anybody who wants to take him. It's just like, why do you want him at, you know, at eight or 10 to one? Right. I, I understand that this is coming up. I mean, I, I hate to be kind of a Debbie downer, but it's coming up a historically weak race. It's, it's coming up a historically slow race and it is beginning to look a lot like 2017 where, you know, we were sort of contenderless by the, the final two weeks. And all of a sudden everybody was like, well, always dreaming is training like a madman. Maybe he's just going to win. By the way, it was in 97 for Always Dreaming okay. in his Florida Derby. Um, so this was a 95 for Kings Barnes. Kind of a similar profile between the two, really. Maybe Todd was a, a little bit – he he didn't rush Kings Barnes, but Kings Barnes did debut later. So, But I, I do think a, you know, a bit of a favorable type of, uh, of profile between the two, a good comparison. Um, I mean, other horses to talk about, you lead off. Tell me uh, – I got a couple that I would be willing to mention. In coming out of this race, yeah, yeah, let you take it away. I mean, I don't know how good he is, but I would be willing to give Instant Coffee another shot underneath in the Derby at a price he had no setup at all. Um, also felt like a you know an entirely inside dominated race, and he was outside the entire way. I don't want to I don't want to liken it to Country House. I think he's a better horse than Country House. So I've never loved Saez as a fit for this horse. I feel like Luis is a is a much more adept front end type rider. And I'd actually be happy if, uh, if Sia settles on tap at trice and maybe we see a new jockey on, uh, 
on instant coffee, but I'd be, I'd be totally interested in him, um, you know, down the road, potentially in the Derby to get a, get a share of it. I don't see why he wouldn't participate. I think he has enough points anyway. So I, I, I also think that this arm is a horse that's going to run better in his next start. I just think the Derby might be too much. You know, I almost wonder if the, if the connections, it wouldn't behoove them a little bit to say, you know what, let's kind of, let's kind of try and go through the back door and maybe we point to the Preakness or, you know, maybe we go a little bit of a softer route and target kind of a second half campaign. He did run well, you know, he did kind of suck along on the inside for the most part, but he did make really the only, he was the only horse I think who passed more than two horses in the entire race. So it's sort of a remarkable chart. Um, so yeah, those are the only two I would mention. I mean, Jace's road is, he had about as easy a trip as you could get and, and still got tagged for second. So yes. there might be derbies out there for him, but they're not in Kentucky. No, or and or a cutback. It is an interesting race where, you know, we talk a lot about race flow and you can't always see it live. Sometimes race flow is something you go back and you look at pace figures, um, the work that Jake Jacobs does over at racingflow.com. And, and you, you know, you can sort of figure out this race. You, you didn't need any of that to see how against the flow that this arm and especially instant coffee was, I mean, instant coffee tried that slingshot move and, you know, ended up emptying out. But as you said, in a race that flowed to the inside and was a pure merry-go-round with the exception of if you take disarm out one, two, three at the corner, well, one, two, three on the wire. Yeah. Like, those horses ran a lot better. My fear is that the final time just isn't that hot. Now, the that the you mentioned always dreaming's figure. I know some private figure makers, and I'm th thinking specifically of Sean Borman, did have that race higher. I'm going to be talking to Sean for the Pro Player Diary. I'll prep him for this question and see he was about as high on always dreaming as any like you know quote unquote sharp player was. I'll be curious to see if if he thinks there might be a little bit more here. I'm more inclined to take your view and more inclined to take a little bit of a dim view of this form as a pointer for the Kentucky Derby, but I certainly am not going to, I'm not going to fully hold it against disarm and instant coffee, but I'm going to need big prices to bet them back out of fear. And again, we'll see what all the other figure makers do too. But assuming that 95 is an ironclad fig, um, I don't want to fall in love with trips and slow races from, from those two, but they, they certainly ran better than the bare form appears. I think uh, I'm in complete agreement with you as far as, uh, as far as that goes. What about, let's see, where, where should we go next? Let's um, let's talk about two fills. Um, and this was a story. Um, the, the, the human interest story here was uh, tremendous in the Jeff Ruby stakes with uh, Jarrett Loveberry coming out of that, uh, coming out of that nasty accident um, not, uh, not too far, uh, not too many weeks in the future. And, uh, and, and, and putting that, uh, putting that behind him aboard two fills who, you know, won by as far as he wanted to in this spot really just made a mockery out of this race. It's always tricky trying to figure out where the synthetic form fits when it comes to the Kentucky Derby, but we've seen that just dismissing it out of hand is not always a wise move. What do you think of the two fills in terms of what he did on Saturday? And what do you think of his prospects going mm. forward? You know, I thought his dirt races going in were easily good enough to be considered a contender. And then for him to step up the way he did and run the way he did in the, uh, in the Jeff Ruby stakes sort of makes you feel like, well, you know, now you should kind of really be on board. And now he looks a little different than he would have otherwise. So there's uh I think there's plenty to like, you know, one of the things that looked very different on Saturday, as opposed to what we've seen from him prior is that he, he didn't look like he had any distance limitations at all on Saturday. Right. He did. He did look like more of a, you know, I think you and I even mentioned at one point, potentially a cutback type of horse on the dirt. Um, I wonder if that maybe had to do with the fact that he had kind of taken the worst of it pace wise in his last two starts. And he, he got a little bit better of it this time around. You know, the problem that we're dealing with with two fills is that this is a horse who's going to come into the Kentucky Derby with two of his best races being on a sloppy track and on a synthetic track. Is he a horse that I think is an automatic move up if it rains? I, I think he's a horse that I'd give more consideration if it rains. But, you know, I think you could do a lot worse than using this horse at 15 or 20 to 1. It's just that kind of, of derby. And, um, and I thought he looked very professional. I thought he did what he was supposed to do. Again, you know, these are connections that have done extremely well on synthetics. Uh, Larry Ravelli was basically 40% in 
in the final season at Arlington Park and probably 30 plus percent in the last five years, it was open overall. Um, hard as it is for me to say that. And so it's um, yeah. So, I mean, there's no surprise that he moved up quite a bit and, and he really did. I mean, he, he looked like an entirely uh, different horse, a better horse on the synthetic surface. 101 was it on the buyer scale? I mean, that 101. Depending on what we see in the next few weeks, that's going to be one of the higher figs um, that anybody brings. I, I wonder what kind of paramutual attention this horse is going to get. I'll take a look and see if there's been any uh, movement on him now. I mean, he's still he's sitting at 25 to 1 in the anti post. I mean, I, if you can get that on the day, it's it's hard to go too wrong. I mean, what's the likelihood that somebody runs better than a 101, right? Do you see the probables for the Wood Memorial? It's I don't know not- if they could run a, a 101 without a rider. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, Forte is not a fast buyer horse either. I mean, and I, and I don't say that because I'm saying that Forte is slow. I say that because, you know, what are the circumstances that lead to Forte getting a 105 buyer? Right. I mean, I don't think Irad is going to is going to really put it to him at the eighth pole to make sure that he expends enough energy to get 100 plus fig in the Florida Derby. So and then you've got Santa Anita. I mean, that's kind of a you could always have a horse run off and and wire the field or something out there. But um, and the bluegrass looks like a race that, you know, is going to be more of a stayers type anyway with Tappet Trice and some of those. So, yeah, it's a little be interesting to see if uh, if we get anybody running that fast. One thing that these horses don't do a lot of Pete is run fast. <laughs> Not to this point. Kings Barnes sitting at 12 to one, two fills at 25. Another one of the winners over the weekend coming out of uh, the Dubai Derby is uh, Derma. Sotogake, part of the Japanese, uh, just amazing international performance. I haven't seen any figures on this, but this was a raw time that was fast. Now, this is always a famously difficult card to make speed figures for with as much as uh, the track seems to change with the desert weather going from the blazing sunshine to uh, through through the, the cooler uh, sunset and then, and then on to the dark. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I mean, the horse looked... It's certainly going to be an interesting storyline. And I mean, we're just getting to a point where it's hard to rule out what the ceiling is on what the Japanese can do internationally. Do you think this horse is a serious contender? What do you think of the current odds of 20 to one on Derma Sotagake? Yeah, I, I think you have to consider him a serious contender. I mean, they are, this has been the result. I mean, you saw a lot of people say this or something similar to this. This has been the result of a decades long operation by the Japanese to, to get to an international stage with legitimate dirt horses and, um, and it's paying off, right. It's also paying off on turf as well yes. because they've obviously perfected some of their, their training methods and um, look, their bloodlines have a lot of American stock in it. And, you know, for the people that seem surprised with how well they've done on dirt, you know, I, I've kind of let a couple of people who brought that up with me know, you know, well, who out there is really breeding for dirt? Right. I mean, we breed for dirt. They're now breeding for dirt because they're they're basically co-opting our breeding strategy. But they're breeding for stayers. You know, they're not breeding for fast workout sales. They're breeding for horses that are going to go classic distances. You know, they're still doing it in a more traditional type of way. And, you know, they got a horse that wanted a mile and three sixteens going away. That's by mind your biscuits. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of uh, funny to see. Uh, Mind Your Biscuits being a horse that had a lot of success at Maidon himself. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see a son of his. But, you know, Pete, the thing that about these horses that are that's getting scary is they're fast. They're not they're not um, pokey plotting types. You know, they're not a lot of the Aiden O'Brien types that we saw over the years that maybe needed things to go their way or, you know, maybe they were a little bit more synthetic inclined, that kind of stuff. These horses have speed. Um, I mean, look at it. Look at how fast Derma Sotogake went start to finish the other night. Yep. So the raw time was fast. Raw time super fast. Raw time is I, I think about seven points faster than the World Cup. So that's strong. You know, that's that's gonna be that should be a figure that comes back pretty, pretty solid. And you know, last year, the only reason why Crown Pride didn't stay is because he got in a duel with another Japanese runner. Right. You know, so if this is a bit more of a paceless race, his chances improve. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Um, now, I will point out that it, it, supposedly that effect of the sunset does deaden the track. It does, um, yeah. But, but still, that's obviously racehorse time, no matter how you slice it. And, and we'll see whether it's Sean or Paul Matisse or some of our friends from overseas, if we can get. We've had success in the past being able to get an actual buyer for, for those races. 
We'll come back to Dubai. I feel like we could do that now, but there's still some more three-year-old stuff to uh, to chat about from from stateside. Let's move over to the Phillies for a second and a, a race we saw on Sunday that just this was one of these visually it looked unbelievable, and I was excited for the clock to come back and uh, and validate what it looked like. I'm talking about in the, the little Florida stake down there at Tampa. Money's gold and the display she put on coming back with a 106 buyer speed figure. We have found our three-year-old filly who does not have the case of the slows, Nick. That is a fact. She, there, there had to be one, right? And, and you know, the good thing about her, she's been fast from day one. She ran, uh, she ran a super fast race in her debut and, um, and came back and, you know, and ran in a little bit more workmanlike fashion at Gulfstream. And uh, I saw somebody say somewhere that I guess Irad said after yesterday's race, I wanted to see what she had. And uh, she's good. No doubt about it. She's, uh, she's very, very good. Uh, you know, the questions, of course, you run into is where will she top out distance wise? Um, is she, you know, a horse that could potentially go a little bit more classic distance? The question that I have, Pete, is, is she a filly that needs Lasix? Um, because this is a filly that is three for three on Lasix. And I don't want to say Todd Pletcher went out of his way to keep her from a spot where she might have to race without Lasix, but he kind of went out of his way to keep her out of a spot where she might have to race without Lasix. You know, she would have been, she would have been a pretty sensible horse in a race like the Beaumont at Keeneland, which comes up early in the meet. Now, that being said, there's nothing wrong with taking the, you know, the Boise State approach to it, so to speak, by having the, you know, the softer, uh, races leading into it. So she apparently is being pointed to the eight bells. I'm, I'm, I will, of course, along with everybody else, be tremendously intrigued by that race and the lead up to it. I mean, she went 120 flat. That is just, that is absolutely soaring. And this is a Philly now with two 100 plus buyer speed figures in three starts. So yeah, she's the one. She's the one we've been waiting for that that's fast. Let's hope that it's, uh, it's not fleeting. Do you think they will eventually consider stretching her out or is this a circle the Breeders' Cup filly and mare sprint and the test and work backwards kind of campaign? What, what, what do you imagine they're going to do? You know, she has one sibling that was a sprinter. Uh, the dam actually was six to one in the Mother Goose in, in 2011, um, probably topped out distance wise around a mile. Ironically, that Mother Goose was won by a Todd Pletcher trainee named Buster's Ready. So there's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a kind of a Shadwell pedigree on the damn side. So you'd almost hope that it was a little bit more of a, of a distance oriented one, but I think, you know, Todd is one that is usually pretty, he's pretty targeted in terms of how he stretches them out distance wise. And the fact that he's not put a little bit more distance into her yet, maybe indicates that he thinks she's a little, you know, she's going to be a little bit slower to get to, to that kind of trip. So I would think maybe eight bells, acorn, and then in the acorn, you figure out whether you have a coaching club, American Oaks Philly or a test Philly. Right. That makes perfect sense. Just let the, let her, let her tell you along the way, but it's, it's exciting. And if the gulf between the kind of figure she's running and the ones who are being pointed towards the Oaks remains what it is, I think at some point you, you probably have to try. Um, you know, uh, uh, unless she tells you very specifically, that's what she does not want. Let's talk about some of the other racing we saw over the weekend. Maybe we'll head back, uh, let's head back to Dubai and talk about some of the racing over there. I mean, this Equinox performance was absolutely eye popping. Another one where we don't have like a specific figure to talk about. I'm sure we can dig up a, an international rating, but to see a horse that's not terribly experience just really running its own race against other accomplished horses i mean I, I thought this one has deserved all the praise it's it's gotten for both uh equinox himself and the and the japanese breeding program in general unclear what the next stops will be connections were were cagey about it i mean you'd certainly think the arc would be on the list i i was dreaming that maybe we'd see an ascot appearance from equinox but I mean, this, this is a performance that certainly needs to be discussed. And if you haven't seen it, I, I say go to YouTube and watch because you you don't see what runs like this too often. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I admittedly am unfamiliar with the uh, the Japanese calendar, but it's a little more geared towards like a fall and 
and winter type of of uh of situation right i mean i don't recall there ever being tremendously big races in the summer in japan there is there are some grade ones the or group ones i guess you'd say but it's i really think you know the way they have coveted the arc over the years it'll be you would a, think they you would know, want to go there yeah work back yeah. from work back from there and see what see what preps work we'll talk to we'll talk to klaus or somebody from the team they'll they'll be able to theorize better than we will uh, about what the plans will be in terms of like the high points of the jra calendar Right. And so, you know, having one that's no show autumn um, and, and of course they skipped the, the Japan Cup to run in the Arimikin N and, and he was obviously very impressive in there as well. Um, yeah. I mean, you would think that that this is a horse that's going to dance every big dance in a globally that you could find. Um, it, it also portends that in a West Coast Breeders' Cup, I'm guessing we're going to get a lot of Japanese participation this year. Yes. And, you know, we saw how that went in 2021 at Del Mar. And um, I'm guessing we're going to get a lot of it again. So it's uh, don't be surprised if the Japanese Raiders take home a lot of a lot of the prize there. I, I, I kind of I will admit I was watching the the Shima Classic on my phone. I was pulling into Sam Houston and I, it reminded me of watching international races with my father or if there was an international horse in a race in America. And if they ever got the early lead, he was like, well, this is over. We'll never <laughs> run down one of their horses. <laughs> no, see, he took the lead down the backstretch and was like, oh, my God. And so I was. I was trying to keep up with the fractions because they, they had the, the, uh, the clock basically reducing the amount of time or amount of, of, of uh, meters left number of meters left with the clock. And so I think he went the mile in like 39 and I thought, well, oh, man, this horse is going to be, and that's from a standing start, but I thought, yeah, this, this horse is more than likely going to sprint home in a little bit less than 48, which uh, I think he did. I don't remember what the final time was, but it was, you know, he was sensational. He came home. He came home fast and you know geared down. It, it was a very impressive performance and and one that you know will certainly be will certainly be following along the the world stage wherever he uh, goes next. What else? What other highlights did you have from a World Cup night? I thought it was great to see Sibelius win. Uh, Jeremiah O'Dwyer um, pulled off the rare Dubai Golden Shaheen and Spirit of Texas double <laughs> winning at the. Uh, at Maidan and at Sam Houston, but I'm um, all kidding aside. He's done a really excellent job with Sibelius. I mean, to, you know, to kind of put in perspective what that horse has done in a relatively short period of time, we saw him win a two other than at Saratoga. Okay. So, you know, he's gone from winning a two other than to getting his first graded stake win in December, um, winning the Pelican and now winning the golden Shaheen. And, you know, maybe Pete, we were, we were a little flippant in not recognizing that he's a marquee sprinter. You know, and talking too much about there not being that many really top flight sprinters out there, but um, hope maybe we see him in the true north or a race like that around Belmont weekend and hopefully back at Saratoga because he ran very well and uh, didn't have the easiest go of it. He had a, he ended up having a perfectly fine trip, but he did break from the rail and Ryan Moore worked out an excellent trip for him. It was also a good good effort in defeat by Gnight, who um, the Asmussen Barn put on this international plan of running twice overseas and uh, he picked up a couple of, of placings he looks like a horse that might be you know just a little bit off the the marquee sprinters but still one that's that's very talented but you know hopefully we get a hopefully we're about five months away from a forego where we see you know him and elite power and and Sibelius and they all throw it down that would be super exciting. The Lord North story was great. Good to see uh, Frankie back in the winner's circle and that horse who clearly loves it around there. But then uh, Japan once again in the big one, the $12 million Dubai World Cup with uh, Ushba Tesoro getting the job done. Uh, and, and, you know, could at this point, I don't think anyone was surprised to see Japan taking home the big prize. Not at all. I mean, in fact, it, it almost feels like a fait accompli. But, you know, this is a horse who, uh, who came in with very good form and uh, had been running consistently and was ridden to the style of the race quite well. It was a very, very strong pace, which you kind of felt like was going to happen with, uh, with Pontalasa drawing the far outside. And so things really heated up on the front end and that worked in the favor of uh, Oshpa Tesoro who got a great ride as well. So yeah, it's uh, it's the Japanese world right now when it comes to international racing. It's an interesting point you made before about how much more participation we're going to see. It really sounds like, you know, as you've pointed out, they have figured out what works and what doesn't work maybe in terms of shipping. And we saw last year very limited participation with Keeneland because that's a, a tr much trickier ship, trickier quarantine. But 
with the West Coast, um, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how many of these horses we get over there. There may be a true, um, true, it, you know, there's always a true international challenge in the Breeders' Cup on the turf, but to see it on the dirt would be uh, a new and interesting wrinkle that you know I'm I'm looking forward to following. I, I think it could be I think it could be a lot of fun. We'll see we'll see where they end up. Uh, we'll see where they end up going. Any other thoughts of uh, the runners coming out of the big one, the Dubai World Cup, Algiers, Country Grammar? Any any thoughts on any of those? I mean, it wasn't a particularly compelling performance by uh, any of the American runners. Country Grammar looks like he might be getting a little long in the tooth. Um, so I wonder if you know what exactly he has left i know he ran well in the san antonio and i don't think that his effort the other night precludes him from coming back here and being a you know a top-notch handicap horse that says a little bit more about our handicap division right now than about him right so uh, i would say you know don't be shocked if um if we do get a couple of decent efforts out of him especially because you know handicap division wise one of the races we were gonna gonna talk about was the new orleans classic and uh, art collector who had won a pretty key race in the the Pegasus came back and was pretty dull. It really did not look good. And I did have that on my list to talk about. I do want to just name check Broom quickly for his win. Sure. Only because it makes me feel better about my Breeders' Cup turf pick that didn't work out so well. But it was nice to see him come back and show that he had another uh, big victory next to his name in a race he was actually trying to win at some point. It just wasn't the one that I picked him for. But yeah, let's talk about the, let's talk about the, the rest of that Fairgrounds card. You know, I mean, this race, that Pegasus that... Um, art collector came out of it was amazing to me how many horses had come back and run better so the sort of facile solution of oh the bounce it like i don't know I, I i mean he did run so much better than everybody else you can't rule it out but man he was just unbelievably dull in there and and, and i was trying to you know i was wanting to try to explain how his pegasus could be as good as i thought that was and that that his uh New Orleans race could be as bad. And I don't really have any, uh, I don't really have any explanation. I mean, I say bad. I mean, he was second, but you know, beaten rather easily by West will power. What, what, what did you make of this? Is it one of those things where you should be giving more credit to the winner and not worrying as much about our collector or, or, you know, or is it fair to say this was pretty darn disappointing? Oh, it, regardless of how you feel about the winner um, to say that it was disappointing by our collector is, is totally acceptable. Um, you know, back in 2016, I put together a couple of, of winning bets in a row in the Belmont Stakes contest, and I got myself into contention, and I made an enormous win bet on time and motion for Jimmy Toner in the Just a Game. And I'm sorry, uh, it was either time and motion or Recepta, maybe Recepta. And she was beaten by Celestine, and Celestine got a 107 buyer. Right. And for the rest of Celestine's career, every time I looked at her PPs and that she beat my Jimmy Toner horse, by three lengths very comfortably, I said to myself, where the hell did that race come from? <laughs> and as time has gone by, I feel like of all the marquee trainers in the game, nobody has more where the hell did that race come from than Bill Mott. Interesting. And and I'm going to I'm gonna chalk up right now until further notice that our collector's Pegasus was aware of the hell did that come from. <laughs> because it was just so much better than anything he's ever run. He looked so much more... I don't know, so so much more competent, so much more professional. Uh, maybe it was just the perfect outside stalking trip, but everything about the way he ran in that race said nothing about the way he ran on Saturday, right? I mean, he had, I, I get it. I get the slight excuses, the being inside, you know, West willpower, having a clean run. It wasn't a slow pace. It was a solid pace. He had no excuse. He was just bad. Right. He was even now. I, I shouldn't be overly harsh. He did run second. You know, he did get a he did get a solid speed figure. 103. But, I mean, it's not as I, I was guessing it was going to be lower than that. You know, that's in that's in the wheel. You know, when you look at his I'm looking at his PP cut right now. I should share it on the screen, but I don't want to mess up and, and, and screw up the video here. But the it like it makes more sense on paper than it did like in my head watching the race. You know, in back in the Woodward when he had the perfect trip of all perfect trips. He did actually have another 107 in his PP cut that, you know, he ran back to in the, in the Pegasus. And then, you know, his race after the Woodward is the Peters Cup classic. That almost doesn't even count that. That was just a weird, remember that that was a weird, yeah. 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 Mike Smith kind of grabbed him. I mean, Nick Skull was going to probably beat him in best of speed anyway, but you, you don't even worry about that figure. But then, 
yeah, I mean, just seeing it here as a 103, it just looks like I oh, found one better. It doesn't, it doesn't look as bad on paper as it did in real life, if that makes right. any sense. Right. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, looking at his PPs now, I, I, um, I feel, you know, a similar sentiment. I guess it was just that the, the 107 that he got in the Pegasus felt like a little bit of a different 107 than that Woodward. For sure. That, you know, it was around two turns versus one, et cetera, et cetera. But no, I totally get your point. Um, I mean, it begs the question, are we, are we just completely and totally underselling the winner um, as far as West willpower goes? I mean, this is a horse that has run well on numerous occasions. I mean, maybe the horse right now is last samurai, right? Maybe he is just the boss in this division by a mile and, and everybody else is, is kind of running at him. It, it's hard to believe he's going to hold up for the whole year. But I mean, the good thing is he's in Wayne Lucas's barn. So he'll run 44 times <laughs> and we want to see good horses run. So I'm fine with the coach having one, but uh, yeah, maybe Wes willpower has just come into his own as a, as a six-year-old now. It is interesting to see looking at his PP cut, you know, he'd had, he popped with a hundred in the, in the Iceland against code of honor, but then, you know, it was very consistently nineties buyer type horse until late in that five-year-old year. We're not really used to horses. I mean, it's logical that a horse just sort of following the normal development pattern would get better like maybe peak late in the five-year-old year. We just don't see it very often, but now it's now since the calendar's turned to six, I mean, a 103 and a 109. Yeah. I mean, Brad Cox keeps him together and which he's, you know, certainly has the skill set to do. It feels like a horse that could have more valuable prizes next to his name. And, and, and maybe, you know, I think part of me at first was like West willpower, like the six-year-old is really going to run this big race that, that makes our collector run re something representative here. But when you look at the, when you, this is why you do race review, when you go back and look at it, like that story makes sense. This horse has just gotten, this horse has gotten very fast. And, you know, I, I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see where they, where they turn up and, and who looks like what um, another point, um, worth mentioning is this was a Lasix race too. Um, and we do know that our collector has acted well um, off Lasix. And when you look at the big West willpower races, um, yeah, I mean, he's run well off Lasix too. Those, the, the, the Clark last year only beaten three quarters and the, and, and winning the Fayette. So it'd be interesting to see what, you know, what happens when these two reoppose and what the odds board does as well. Is the market going to start to respect this West willpower a little bit? Yeah, I think that'll be an interesting question. I imagine we'll see him, uh, I'd guess, the Ali Sheba on Oaks Day and um, see if he's uh, if he moves forward. Um, you know, people will scoff at the idea that he's become much better with, with Brad Cox, but I think his PPs really tell the story. What's helped this horse get better is that they're using his speed. Mm -hmm. He's really, he's showing more speed. He's Brad Cox also trains his horses very, very hard, which the successful dirt trainers do. And when you put a lot of stamina and conditioning into horses, you can, you can get more out of them. You get more speed out of them. You get more stamina out of them. And guess what? That's what wins dirt races. That sounds about right. The attritional nature of dirt racing can lend itself to that type of program. Um, I didn't have too much else from the last weekend. We do have PPs already looking for the earliest look ahead to next weekend. Did you have anything? Are we remiss in not highlighting anything else that happened last weekend before we take a little look ahead? No, I think we touched on all the big spots for sure. We've got another big weekend coming up. And luckily, as you said, we've got PPs out already for uh, the uh, Florida Derby card. And I think we'll get them later today for Oakland. Yeah, that sounds right. I mean, it's going to be great. We got all week to look at these races. I'll be doing some uh, horse by horse analysis over at the races.com. We'll come up with some special coverage too over on the in the money plus side. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting. They were already uh, Todd Pletcher not being too pleased with the the draw for Forte. How much of a how much difference do you think it makes for for a horse like this in a field like this? Oh, I'd I'd rather have the eleven than the one, right? right. I mean, with a, with a style like his. So, um, I mean, with all due respect to our friends at Gulfstream, that might have more to do with Todd not loving that he's going to have five fifty to one shots inside of him. Right. But, you know, he's he contributes to those horses being 50 to one too, being a short price. But, you know, Gulfstream covets having a packed starting gate. And I mean, look, this I don't think I don't think Mike Lake would deny that there's some horses in here that really don't belong in a grade one. But, hey, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, you're trying to fill the gate. It's what you do. Yeah, I mean it. It'll 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 turn over a lot more money for having those those horses at those at those big prices. Yes, yeah, Safi Joseph really uh, making a run with some long shots in here. He's got what four runners? Yeah, four runners signed on, um, all drawn inside of Forte. 
none of which really fit on paper with him. Who who do you think is the main danger to Forte from your first look at these PPs? I mean, I I guess you'd probably have to say an aggressively ridden mage. Um, I, I still wonder if it's not just a little a little bit more than mage can handle. And if they're, you know, maybe, maybe asking him to do a little bit too much too soon, but with Saez, they're obviously going and they're going to see, you know, where he, how far he can get them. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that's, I, I mean, I, I guess it, this, it, it, I will have to say, Pete, it, it's going to be very surprising if, if Forte loses this race. I mean, this is just not, there just aren't horses in here that are competitive with him on paper. Yeah. So it's going to be, it's going to be very surprising. And, and it's really, you know, it's not, not, oh, well, poor us, but it's going to set up a handicapping quandary as far as the Derby goes that, you know, he'll come in with two just really pillow soft races and um, probably both pretty favorable from a pace standpoint as well. So it's going to be a, you're going to have a horse that's going to be a short price in Kentucky that's taking on a lot that he hasn't seen. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. It'll be interesting to see if any of these horses drawn outside around him. Um, and I mean, and also he will possibly have the ability to overcome a little adversity depending on what happens with this uh, with this pace. You got to figure one of the Safis is going to gun and that should help him in theory, right? Not having Mage out there on a, on a loose lead if that's going to be the plan with him. Um, and would think, you'd also think that Cyclone Mischief will be forwardly ridden again. Um, given the improvement that he showed actually at a, I had a friend call me and say, Oh, you should tell Marshall about this horse nautical star when he was going to make his second start. He said he's an Oklahoma bred. And I looked and I thought, Oh, these people bred this horse and they own him. They'll never sell him. Well, guess what? Everybody has their price. <laughs> and, and, I, and I did not think that, uh, that he would show up in the Florida Derby. Hopefully Safi has an eye on getting him back to the sooner state somewhere down the line. This looks like a little, little bit of an ambitious placement, but uh, yeah, you'd have to think that, you know, Mr. Peaks looks like a horse that's probably just going to go, um, you know, maybe West coast cowboy will have a little bit more speed. He showed a little bit of speed in the Holy bull. And as we mentioned, cyclone mischief, Mr. Ripple. Yeah. It's uh, these, this is not exactly a murderer's row lined up against Forte. Did you see, excuse me. I was trying to get that yes. question out before I pleased. Oh, well, did you see the problems for the, uh, for the, uh, Arkansas race. I did. They, the field is actually drawn. Um, it, it is just the rest of the card is not. Gotcha. So um, I think what I saw yeah, here was it that it is a field of 11. Yep. Yeah, it is a field of 11. Bourbon Bash, Interlock Empire, Harlow Cap, Two Eagles River, Airtime, Angel of Empire, Rocket Can, Reincarnate, King Russell, Red Route 1 and Colomio. So my understanding is that the the horse that won the Rebel is training up to the Derby. Wow. Um, which, you know, just gets us closer to the to the inevitable notion that horses are going to start once at three and then go to the Derby. Oh, my God. It's so crazy. Yeah. It's insane. Wow. Um, yeah, so that's the field. I'm, I mean, I'm taking a wild shot at a morning line. I thought I may have seen a morning line somewhere. I, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing Rocket Can will be a slight fave. Maybe. Got some good form. Reinca Reincarnate has some good form, right? Yeah, Reincarnate seems like the universal trip horse after getting into some trouble in the Rebel. Um, you know, that was a that was a race where you wanted to come from off the pace anyway. So I don't know how much he'll be upgraded because of that. Uh, yeah, so we'll we'll see how those uh, how those shake out. We'll be here later in the week to uh, to talk about it all. Going to have uh, going to have plenty of coverage. I mean, these next few weeks are just they're just loaded. There's just so much good stuff happening, and then we'll have Keeneland coming online. And and you know, I really really can't wait now that we're down to the business end. I'll I'll let folks know that magic day that comes up, where when you sign up for In the Money Plus, you get all the Keeneland coverage as well as the full Derby package for just one month. That's coming up right down the pike. But Nick, I, I think we've, uh, we've done what we're, we're going to do for today. Appreciate you looking back at these races and we'll bother you later in the week for one thing or another. What do you think? Sounds good, my friend. Looking forward to it. All right. Great stuff. This has been uh, a production of In the Money Media. Our business managers, Drew Coatney. Our chief creative officers, Jonathan Kinchin. I'm Peter Thomas Fornatal. 
We're going to thank a couple of people before I throw it to the clothesline, including Nick Tamara, our founding partners, 10 Strike Racing and the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. Most of all, thank all of you out there for watching, for listening. Rate, review, and subscribe on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast. Drop us a comment on the YouTube channel. Who are you interested in for the Kentucky Derby at this point? Is anybody going to beat Forte? That's another way of asking the question. I'm Peter Thomas Fornatel. May you win all your photos. <laughs>